welcome to this video edition of Playing at the World. I'm John Peterson. And today I want to talk about dice, in particular the polyhedral gaming dice of the 1970s and how to identify them. Now, if you just want to roll old school, there is nothing wrong going with the dice from the Holmes basic set. These five polyhedrons were by far the most common gaming dice of the late 1970s. Hundreds of thousands were made, there are still plenty in circulation, and they are 100% bona fide. But they weren't the only gaming dice that were made and marketed to gamers in the 1970s, and this video is a guide to identifying that first generation of gaming dice. Maybe if you have old dice and you're not sure who made them or when, or you want to start hunting these down and collecting them yourself, this video should be able to help. And along the way, we'll talk about how the massive gaming industry we have today got started. So uh, get cozy, it is a bit of a long story. Before we start, um, it's important to say that polyhedral dice were not invented in the 1970s. Uh, most war games before 1970 only used six-sided dice, but war gamers who wanted to resolve complex statistical probabilities knew the limitations of only being able to generate random numbers one through six. In fact, in the late 19th century, uh, the war game Strategos called for resolving numbers between one and 12. And in order to support that, they required the use of something called a teetotum. These sorts of uh, numbered spinning tops were relatively common at the time, and you could also find them in six sides and eight sides. It would be pretty tough to make a spinning top like this with 20 sides it can fall on, though. And so instead, for resolving numbers between 1 and 20, they had something they called a teetotum ball, which, as you can see, is a die that is numbered 1 through 20. So polyhedral dice were always around, and plenty were made throughout the 20th century for all kinds of purposes. But fancy polyhedral dice weren't really available to wargamers before in 1970. D&D uh, came out of the wargame community, and the board wargames published up until that time pretty much had to rely on six-sided dice. Uh, a good example of that, when Strategy 1 came out in 1970, SPI wanted to be able to resolve numbers between 1 and 10 in their combat resolution tables, and the only way they could manage that was by including chits, little numbered flecks of cardboard that you would shake up and you would pull out of a hat, basically. But then, at the end of 1969, wargamers started to become aware that there were dice that could generate numbers 1 through 10. Uh, the Japanese Standards Association had been manufacturing them since at least the early 1960s, and they came in a nice little case like this. Now, they made them for scientific purposes, not for gamers, but that didn't mean gamers couldn't use them. And there was an American scientific organization that distributed a set like this for $6, which was pretty expensive at the time, but... Um, some more gamers bought them, and you do see pictures of these in some of the period fanzines. The JSA dice have 20 sides with two sets of 10 faces, each numbered 0 through 9. Uh, this would become the standard for D20s in the 1970s. Um, early on, people called these decimal dice or deci dice sometimes, and if you rolled two of them together, you could yield a percentile value. The JSA case actually serves as a way to roll the dice. Uh, you just shake it, set it down, and then you can read the values through the clear plastic in the back. Since the dice are pretty tiny, uh, here I'll set one next to a Holmes basic die for comparison, um, the case is also handy in that it keeps them organized so you don't actually lose them. The JSA dice are easy to recognize because of their small size and the distinctive numbering typeface on them. I'll have a bit more information about how to recognize them on my blog. By the time word of the JSA dice reached England, there was already a group there planning to manufacture D20s locally, the Bristol War Games Society. Uh, the Bristol dice were the first D20s made by gamers for gamers. They were precision engineered down to a thousandth of an inch, and they sold them in a pair as a black and a red die, which looked like this. These dice are a bit harder to identify. There's not a lot of period photography of the dice of the 1970s. Um, one way we can authenticate them, though, is by looking at uh, exact drawings that were made of these dice. If we look at the cover of one of the Bristol War Game Society newsletters, uh, we'll see a picture of their D20. If we compare that picture to this inked example of a red D20, uh, we can see how the faces align, how the 2 in the middle is bounded by a triangle that touches the 9, the 8, and the 6. Now, there's usually some rhyme or reason uh, to the placement of the numbers on a die, uh, what we'll call today the dice map. The Bristol die uses an additive dice map, and what that means is that if you take a die like this and you look at a number on one face, that and the face on the opposite side 
if you sum them, will add up to the same number. In the Bristol dice, that number is 9. So, for example, if you find a number 4, the number on the opposite side will be a 5, adding up to 9. Uh, if you find a 7, on the other side will be a 2, adding up to 9. And if you find a 9, the other side will, of course, have a 0. This is the best way to identify the Bristol dice. Um, if you find red or black dice that have this additive map adding up to 9 and they match the picture from that journal that I showed, then what you most likely have there is a Bristol die. Now, Bristol dice are scarce, though. Uh, they were sold to support some Bristol War Game Society uh, games like this Colonial Skirmish War Game rules, which use these as percentage dice, where the red die represented tens and the black die single digits. Along with those rules, a small number of these dice were imported to America by a distributor named Lou Zaki, who would soon become the prime mover of the American dice industry. Luckily, news of the Bristol dice reached Gary Gygax, who was, at the time, working on a modern war game for Gaiden games to be called Tractics. Now, Tractics is actually the first American game that calls for the use of a 20-sided die to resolve combat. So that meant Gaiden games needed to find a source for these dice in America. In 1972, word began to spread through the hobby community that a company in Palo Alto, California, called Creative Publications, made a set of five polyhedral solids for sale as dice uh, for a buck thirty-five each. There are a few photographs of these to be found in the era, uh, like this one. These dice were the first full polyhedral set that gamers could buy in the 1970s. As you can see, the D20 is a bit larger than a Bristol die, and where the Bristol die used an additive map. The Creative Publications D20 has what we call a symmetrical map. That is, if you see the number of 7 on one side on the opposite face, there will also be a 7. I found 7 to be the most useful number for a symmetric map, so we'll call the Creative Publications map a 7235. Uh, the three numbers touching the triangle surrounding the 7 are a 2, a 3, and a 5. There's a white D20, a blue D12, a green D8, a pink D6, and a yellow D4. I've heard some uncertainty about whether the first D6s that shipped in the Creative Publication sets were or were not pink. Uh, unfortunately, as I said, there's not a ton of color photography of these things that we can recover from the 1970s, but there is fortunately one picture that shows a table at Gen Con in 1974 with a number of these Creative Publication sets on it, and all three of the D6s in that picture are pink, which I think is pretty decisive evidence uh, for what the earliest ones were. Creative Publications still shipped these pink dice into the 1980s, as this catalog image shows. Gaiden Games resold the Creative Publications dice to support Tractics, and Gary Gygax experimented with them throughout 1973, even writing an article about the fascinating statistical probabilities that you could generate using these non-six-sided dice. Uh, famously, he lighted on the idea that he could use them for chance tables in this set of fantasy medieval campaign rules that he was working on at the time, which, of course, was Dungeons & Dragons. So when Gary's new company, Tactical Studies Rules, TSR, published D&D in 1974, um, they resold these creative publication solids, making them the first dice that gamers used to play D&D. At first, uh, TSR marked them up to $1.75, um, but that climbed pretty quickly up to $2.50. In fact, that there were weeks there in 1974 when dice revenue accounted for like half of the gross money that went into TSR. Because D&D called for rolling numbers between 1 and 20, not between 1 and 10, you needed some way to figure out if you rolled a 7 or a 17. So we see a number of early examples where people have marked these dice up, uh, for example, inking in half the sides in a different color, or perhaps uh, you know, just shading entirely some of the faces of the die, or even putting little markers on them so that you could uh, tell which one to add 10 to when the face came up. There was no single convention, so you see a lot of variety in this. Now, once people became obsessed with D&D and these dice started getting a lot of use, gamers quickly discovered that Creative Publications dice were not necessarily built to last. Even with a little bit of use, uh, they start to lose their edges, smooth over to the point where when you roll them, um, some of them are a little better than marbles. They'll just wander around your table like they're spherical, basically. Putting some of these highly distressed examples next to an original, you might not even think that they were dice of the same manufacturer. Uh, they just get so much smaller with use. And so there was an opportunity for someone to make a higher quality of dice. And in 1975, Lou Zaki seized that opportunity.
He began advertising a new set of D20s of his own manufacture. These were the first dice made in America by gamers for gamers. He made them out of the same polystyrene as crash helmets. Initially, he sold them in a set of one white and one red die, uh, sold for a buck ninety-eight. He charged extra for inking the dice, uh, otherwise you had to ink them in yourself with a sharpie or something. Unlike the Creta Publications dice, Lou's dice were built to last. He even had a two-year guarantee uh, for normal use and wear and tear on his dice. And examples you've seen that have taken a lot of use, um, they may get a bit grimy, uh, but they still roll true. The first generation of D20s that Lou made have what we call a partially symmetric dice map, uh, meaning that sometimes if you look at a number on the face, you'll find the same number on the opposite face, but, but other times they don't. Um, but you will, in his first generation map, always find that the number 7 is flanked by the numbers 2, 4, and 8. And therefore we call Luzaki's first generation dice map the 7, 2, 4, 8 map. Uh, TSR resold Lou's percentile dice along with the Creative Publication set uh, into 1976, into what we call the, the white box era. But Lou's dice were popular enough that he decided he was going to go all in. He was going to make his own complete set of polyhedral dice. Now I say complete, but he started only making four, uh, because everyone already had pit d6s, there was no reason for him to make a new d6. He wanted the d20 that went with the set to be a different color than the ones he'd issued before, so he added to the red and white d20 a blue d20, fitting for the first American set of polyhedral dice, and then added to those a yellow d12, an orange d8, and a green d4. Lou's first generation polyhedral dice have a number of distinctive features. Um, for one, the d12 is much larger than the d20. That's because his d12 was actually modeled on the Creative Publications d12, uh, which is considerably larger than Lou's d20, which was sized more like a Bristol die was sized. Similarly, if you put a Creative Publications D4 next to Lou's D4, you'll see that they have pretty much the same size, the same arrangement of numbers, and the same pointiness. You know, you really don't want to step on one of these Creative Publications D4s, but they're made of softer stuff than Lou's D4s, which are just lethal weapons. So now there were two sets of polyhedral dice on the market. Uh, to compete, TSR just had to lower prices. And they did that by going around Creative Publications and getting to their manufacturer, who was Hong Kong-based, to make orders for massive numbers of these dice. TSR ordered them in massive numbers because they planned to ship them in their new flagship product, the Holmes Basic Set. And this deal let them sell these dice for just a buck forty-nine for a set. At the same time, they decided to stop selling Lou Zaki's D20s as their percentile set, and instead they contracted with their Hong Kong supplier to make a pink D20 that they would then pair with the white one to sell as a percentile set. And these percentile dice pairs would later appear in TSR games like Boot Hill or War of Wizards. While the new TSR dice look very similar to the original Creative Publication set, uh, there are a number of pretty obvious differences, uh, the main one being, of course, the color of the D6. Um, Holmes D6s were always orange and not pink. But in fact, the colors of all of the dice uh, are a little bit different. They're a bit darker. Looking at them up close, the Creative Publications numerals are also better inked and more finely articulated. Lou couldn't undersell TSR, but he could still compete with them on quality and variety. Um, he took his initial D20 mold and started producing it in additional colors. We see yellow and orange and so on. But he also learned from his mistakes in his original first-generation die mold. The most obvious problem was with his oversized D12. Um, it wasn't a word, just warped. I mean, it's practically oblong. Uh, people complained about it, and actually, under the terms of his guarantee, he recalled these dice in 1977 after having made around 5,000 of them. Liu actually took the opportunity, as he redid his D12, to redo his entire first-generation dice mold. And his second-generation dice looked like this. As you can see, the D12 is much smaller, and the edges have been clipped off of the D4, so it's no longer quite as pointy and lethal. Lou made a more subtle change to the D20, and to understand that, we need to get a bit into how dice are actually manufactured. Dice molds have an aperture where liquid plastic is injected into them and then cooled, and that aperture will always leave a blemish on the die, a piece of sprue plastic that needs to be cut off. In his first generation D20, Lou placed the sprue on a vertex, as the Creative Publications dice had before him. The problem is that they can make the five faces that touch the vertex not align properly. 
So in his second generation mold, he moved the sprue from the vertex to a face, uh, the face of the seven on one of his die molds and onto the face of an eight on the other die mold. This is another reason to always start with seven when trying to identify a 1970s die. When Lou redesigned his dice, he decided to make the D20s die map fully symmetrical, and his map became probably the most common one of the dice that followed. It is a 7, 4, 5, 8 map, where the 7 borders the 4, 5, and 8. With his new molds, Lou began making his four polyhedrons in six colors. These were the dice that were available at the time that the first advanced Dungeons & Dragons books hit stores. In 1970, though, he added three new colors, black, brown, and violet. So if you find a Zaki set that has any of these three colors in it, the black, the brown, and the violet, um, you know that that's a set that dates from 1978 or after. And as he added more colors and he switched between them more frequently, he found himself ending up with more of what he called changeover dice. Um, dice that have these interesting swirl effects that result from multiple colors mixing together in the mold. Although he made them accidentally, they became popular enough that in some instances he made them intentionally, as in, for example, these tiger dice, as he called them. Then finally, at Gen Con in 1979, Lou unveiled his first prototypes of what he called gem dice, um, clear polyhedral solids, as in this set here. Though he also, by the end of the year, added a few additional colors to those. There were emeralds and rubies and so on. But in essence, these gem-style polyhedrons were the last to be manufactured in the 1970s. Well, okay, maybe. Maybe there's one other who like snuck in right before the deadline, and that would be Koplow of West Germany. Uh, Koplow had been making casino dice for many years, and they introduced a tumbled, rounded die that was very unusual for the D20s at the time. Um, you can see the ones touch, as do the sevens, which yields for these a seven, two, five, seven dice map. Uh, lucky seven, always perfect for the 1970s. Coplo also introduced a pretty cool pipped D8. But if they did hit the market before January of 1980, it was close. In essence, no one else made polyhedral gaming dice in the 1970s. So, why are there still like seven minutes left in this video? because it can be hard to tell the difference between the dice of the 1970s and the dice that entered the market in 1980, because there was just a flood of them. This followed on a very famous incident right after Gen Con in 1979, uh, the disappearance of a student named James Dallas Egbert and the infamous rumors that he was lost in the steam tunnels that suddenly catapulted D&D into mainstream popularity. TSR instantly went from a place where they were selling, like, five or six thousand copies a month of the Holmes Basics set to a place where suddenly they were selling 40,000 copies a month and there was just no way that their Hong Kong dice supplier could keep up with that sort of demand. And so for a time in 1980, TSR was briefly reduced to the indignity of shipping chits instead of dice in their Holmes Basics sets. And poor Lou Zaki, well, when TSR could no longer sell dice, everyone turned to him and then his supply was completely exhausted immediately. And because of that, pretty much everybody who could enter the dice market decided to do so in 1980. Lou would write in the fall of 1981 that just 18 months earlier, at the start of 1980, he had no competitors in America, and now he had 15. But is it really true? I mean, it may look like other American gaming companies were making their own polyhedral dice before 1980. If you read reports about Gen Con in 1979, for example, you can read about um, a company called The Armory, who was present. It's true that Roy Lippmann and his team drove out from Maryland to Gen Con to sell dice and as well to sell their dice crayons, which you could use to ink in um, uninked dice. But if you looked at the polyhedral dice that they were selling at the time, and many contemporary packages survived, some of which are still um, stapled together, so the dice inside them, you know that they're original ones, um, you'll find that they were actually just Luzaki's dice that the Armory was then reselling. You can identify the earliest armory packaging from the fact that the dice are guaranteed until 1981, uh, two years after 1979. But the problem was, as with anyone else, um, when Lou started to run out of dice in 1980, the armory no longer had anything to package in these, so they decided to start making dice themselves. You see notices in industry magazines to that effect as early as July, but it isn't until the end of the summer that you see the first samples off the production line. The Armory D20 uses the same dice map as Zaki, 
um, but they're easy to tell apart. Famously, their first generation dice switch out the number one for the letter A for armory. Uh, for dice with multiple ones, do note that only one of them will be replaced by an A, so on the D4 there will be two regular ones and then one A. And the armory D12 is probably easily recognizable for the wide circular zero on the 10. But again, these dice did not hit the market until late in 1980. Or take the case of Heritage. Already back in November of 1978, you can see polyhedral dice advertised for sale in their blister packs, but those too were just Zaki's dice. As late as 1980, this uh, Dungeon Dwellers pack here um, still contains Luzaki's dice. To find Heritage's dice, you need to open some of these Adventure Gaming packs, and these contain the dice that Heritage made themselves. Heritage dice are also easy to tell apart from Zaki dice. If you look at a d20, you'll be able to find a little circle imprinted in one of the corners of the triangle that the one is enclosed within. On a Heritage d12, the circle is always the top of the pentagon enclosing the number one. So neither Heritage nor the Armory were actually making dice before 1980, um, even though they were advertising them for sale and selling them at conventions. And you hear rumors I know online about how Windmill had stopped making its dice in 1979. I don't see any evidence they were making dice before 1980. And even at the end of 1981, you can see advertisements for them introducing new colors, so they certainly hadn't stopped making dice yet then. But of course, the largest entrant to the dice market in 1980 was TSR itself, the 800-pound gorilla. Now that they were no longer working with their Hong Kong supply chain, uh, they contracted to have their own dice mold made and manufactured locally in Beloit, Wisconsin, where Game Science Heritage and the Armory had only really manufactured four polyhedral solids. TSR's mold was for six dice. They introduced their own D6, as well as a groundbreaking D10. You can see them as well in this picture from the 1980 Games Masters catalog, buried in a big pile of dice, um, which is incidentally a good kind of retrospective of the dice that were available up to the middle of 1980. Uh, this seems to have been an initial promotional run for TSR. Uh, the later dice that they shipped in the Mold Bay Basic set, most famously, um, didn't have the same kind of sparkly color to them. TSR made another big change as well, in that their D20 was now actually numbered 1 through 20. But the dice map is still faithful to the Creative Publications original. If you find a 7, you will still see that it is flanked by 2, 3, and 5. While it's a bit of a digression to get into TSR, Heritage, and Armory, and so on, it is important to understand how to differentiate those 1980 dice from the dice that were made in the 1970s. There are a couple of easy ground rules. Um, 1970s dice tend to have these hard edges. They won't be tumbled, rounded, smoothed. Um, D20s will be numbered 0 through 9 twice rather than 1 through 20. Um, if you see a D6 or a D10 that was, you know, it's not a PIP D6 and it's not one of these creative publications originals, then probably you're looking at a later die. Um, there are also, if you see any colors in Zaki dice that are different from these, apart from those uh, transitional swirl dice, then that too is a good indicator that it's probably not a vintage 70s die. And I think it's fascinating to go back and to look at these early dice from the 1970s because so much has happened since then in the dice market. Um, even in 1985, the Armory reported that just in the past three years, they'd manufactured around 5 million polyhedral gaming dice. And that gives you a sense of what the demand was. It was fueled by the enormous popularity of Dungeons & Dragons in the early 1980s. And I mean, untold hundreds of millions of these dice must have been made since then, maybe billions. It all really started with these, um, these amateurs who were selling these in very small quantities, people like the Bristol War Game Society, people like Luzaki manufacturing themselves. These amateurs made these dice in extremely small numbers because there was just such a tiny community at the time that they were serving, but now it's millions and untold millions. Um, so that's it for this video. Um, thanks so much for watching. I will have a quick reference guide up on my blog, and let me stress again, you know, this video only covers the dice that were available to the gaming community of the 1970s that you could have bought at the time. That doesn't mean there weren't all kinds of other oddities that could have found their way into your collection. And um, they have their own fascinating stories, but uh, unfortunately those will have to wait for another time. Thanks again.